Bomber by Len Dayton. Chapter 20 The bombers were swimming upwards. Ignoring their assigned heights, most pilots that night kept their noses trimmed skywards and let the technical limitations of their machines decide the altitude at which they turned the trim wheels back to normal. Some of the older Sterlings could not get above 11,000 feet. Even the best ones at 18,000 were not above the extreme range of the 8.8 centimetre flak. The two motor Wellingtons, however, of even older design, could all do better than this, and the best of them at nearly 24,000 feet were flying higher than any other planes in the stream. Lambert had pushed Dor to nearly 21,000 feet. Now he trimmed the control so that the plane was flying hands-off and turned on the automatic pilot. He felt the elevators kick as it engaged. He had corrected course for the changing wind, so they had crossed the British coast at the prescribed assembly point. In his curtained cabin, Kosher watched the shape of the pulses on the scope of the G and calculated their position from its map. He pencilled a dot upon his plotting chart and calculated how much longer it would take until they were over the target. Fifty minutes to TOT, he announced. They had entered Luftwaffe Fighter Grid Square, Heinz Emil IV, although they had no way of knowing that. Now they were at the front of the bomber stream. That was no great navigational achievement. The stream was an unwieldy slab of bombers flying as much as 15 miles to either side of the pencilled route. It was timed to be nearly 200 miles long. So while Creaking Door was over the North Sea, the rearmost aircraft was only just taking to the air. Tonight, visibility was poor and only the sound of 2,800 high-performance engines marked their track. Each of those engines required the manufacturing capacity of 40 simple car engines. The man hours spent constructing each four-motor aeroplane would have built almost a mile of outer barn. The radar and radio equipment alone equaled a million radio sets. The total of hard aluminium amounted to 5,000 tonnes, or about 11 million saucepans. In cash, at 1943 prices, with profits paired to a minimum, each Lancaster cost £42,000. Crew training averaged out at £10,000 each, at that time more than enough to send the entire crew to Oxford or Cambridge for three years. Add another £13,000 for bombs, fuel, servicing and ground crew training at bargain prices, and each bomber was a public investment of £120,000. Without including the oboe mosquitoes, the nuisance raid on Berlin, the OTU planes dropping leaflets upon Ostend, training flights, transport jobs or any of Coastal Command's activities, this bombing fleet cost £85 million. Six bombers had already landed, the boomerangs. Most aircrew hated to abort, for unless they bombed the target the trip didn't count towards their tour. One Lancaster had got as far as the coast when a radiator leak caused the port inner to disappear in a cloud of steam. A Stirling had a faulty radio, and the pilot of a Wellington was suffering from stomach pains. The latter turned back just before the Dutch coast. One Lancaster, taking off from an airfield near Lincoln, bounced badly enough to smash the undercarriage. One wheel went through a barn roof and was unable to retract its landing gear when in the air. Its fuel jettison device failed too. It was still circling its base under orders from flying control. When enough of its fuel had been used to achieve safe landing weight, it would try a landing. At Wiley Fen, John Munro managed a perfect takeoff in spite of a tyre blowout. He'd corrected the resultant swing effortlessly, and two of the crew didn't notice anything unusual. His problem would arise on his return. Creaking Door, S. Sweet, the Volkswagen and Joe for King were all within half a mile of each other, with Lambert 2,000 feet above the others, although on this dark night the only person to know that was the radar operator at Ermin, who watched the blips slide across his screen. Lambert was as high as the plane would go, and the control column was mushy and insensitive in his hands. High above him, almost touching the stratosphere, he could see long, wispy cirrus clouds. At the moment they weren't lying along the wind direction, but the wind would continue to back until they were. They heralded rain, but Lambert's interest in the clouds was a more immediate one and warned of a more immediate danger. The clouds glowed white and luminous, spotlit by a bright moon that had not yet appeared over the horizon. Soon it would appear, and the sky would lighten and the mantle of night would start to go at the elbows. 
the Freya radar warned the smaller, more accurate Würzburg of the stream's route. Its three-man crew complained of the cold, as they always did, and tilted the mirror until suddenly four blips, Dorr, Sweet, the Volkswagen and Joe for King, slid across the hooded radar scope. The number one operator missed three spots of light but held the fourth one and turned to it. Inside the warm, dark plotting room, August held his breath like an angler when the float twitches. Red Würzburg has a contact, sir, said Willy Reinecker, in Heinz Emil IV. It was as August had predicted. He compared the blue spot of light that marked Lovenhertz's night fighter. It was about ten miles away from the red one. Question, your altitude and bearing, Katza one, said August as a double check. It was Sachs, the radar man in the back seat, who replied. Lovenhertz, hearing the call, turned his instrument panel illumination to minimum and leaned close to the black windscreen. He could hear the wind buffeting the hinges and fixtures. Order, Caruso ten left, Katza one, said August. Lovenhertz touched the rudder bar. He knew that he must comply with every instruction immediately it was given, for the heavy Junkers with its clumsy aerial array was not much faster than a Lancaster. For the same reason, its stalling speed was higher. It's a parallel head-on intercept, said August. I'll bring him in slightly to the north of the Tommy. Announcing boring cinema, said Lovenhertz. It was code for poor visibility. Willy Reinecker gave a little splutter of indignation. They are always complaining. He followed the moving points of light across the frosted glass table, marking their progress with a wax pencil so that the converging courses could be seen. In spite of the dimmed lights, August could see that the plotting room had begun to fill up with off-duty personnel who wanted to see the excitement. Prepare. 180 degree turn, said August. That's clear, crackled Lovenhertz's acknowledgement. A starboard turn, August explained to Villy. If he turns to port, he'll pass close enough across his front for the Tommy to spot him. By now, Lovenhertz had become part of the machinery. It was August who was flying the plane. August looked round the plotting room at the expectant faces. Some of the men were in overcoats thrown over pyjamas, their hair awry and faces stubbly. They watched him with the godlike and superior impartiality with which spectators judge card games. An orderly elbowed his way through them and came up the steps of the rostrum with a tray of coffee cups. The coffee soon disappeared and he went back to the kitchen for more. August drank his without tasting it. He watched the two coloured lights rushing towards each other. They represented a combined speed of 600 miles per hour. He knew that a mistake in the timing of Katsawan's turn could cause them to miss the contact. That wasn't an enjoyable thing for the commanding officer to do for an audience of subordinates. Skip, give me a bit of straight and level for a star shot. Kosher Cohen stood under the Perspex Astrodome, fixing the stars through a sextant. Kosher was one of the few RAF navigators who was skilled in its use. At the navigation school, he'd handled it better than his instructor. Where the devil did you learn how to handle one of these, son? My father's yacht, sir, and a bloody comedian to boot. Sit down. Next. There wasn't time for another shot, so he compared his readings with a G-fix. Four shots, with a four-mile-wide cocked hat to show their position. Not bad at all. Cohen looked at his plotting chart in the tiny circle of his desk light. To make good his track, he drew the wind speed and direction and calculated their ground speed from the remaining side of the triangle thus formed. Eleven minutes to the Dutch coast, he said. No one answered. Lambert shifted his behind on the hard parachute pack. The heavy, unpowered controls required a lot of physical strength to move them, and already he had an ache in his shoulder and the usual pain in his spine. He sat upright to stretch his back and rolled his shoulders. We are within radar range, he warned the crew. Keep your eyes peeled for fighters. Like all of the bomber stream's wireless operators, Jimmy Grimm, whose father had a radio shop in Highgate, was tuning his radio to the frequencies between 7050 and 7100 kilocycles, trying to find an enemy voice. Then he could transmit a signal on the same frequency to blot out the conversation between controller and fighter pilots. A microphone was fitted into an engine of each bomber especially for this purpose. Suddenly, he heard August's voice. Order, start turning, now. Turning, said Lovenhertz. Jimmy Grimm was excited. I found one of their controllers in a night fighter. August Bach's voice came over the headphones with the same clarity that Lovenhertz heard it. Order, steer 097 degrees, said August, announcing enemy range 10 kilometres. The plane he's following is on our heading, said Cohen. Every plane in the stream is on our heading, said Digby. 
He was full length in the nose, trying to see the Dutch coast. I wish I could understand German better, said Jimmy Grimm. That's the trouble with being a radio ham. In peacetime, I used to pick up all sorts of stations and only speak a few words of everything. While you types are sodding about, some poor bastard is going to get the chop, said Digby. Why don't you jam him? Perhaps it's us he's after, said Binty from the mid-upper turret. Can we steer on to 080 degrees just to be sure, Skipper, said Cohen. You're the navigator, said Lambert, and put the plane into a shallow banking turn. He's still a long way behind the bomber, said Cohen, and the controller keeps telling him to lose height. You're still well above him, August told Lovenhertz. Lose another 500 metres. Again, Lovenhertz touched the control column and the fighter dipped. Beside him, the observer had his field glasses on his lap. The bomber was too far away and the night too dark for there to be a chance of visual contact, yet... Behind Lovenhertz, facing rearwards, the radar operator was boxed in with so much equipment that he was scarcely able to move. His three radar screens that showed range, altitude position and lateral position were tucked under his right elbow, and to see them he had to cock his head on one side like a sparrow. It was useless to look at them yet, for the equipment wouldn't show the target until they were 3,000 metres away. Order, hold it, warned August. Lovenhertz throttled back. Flash Gordon was staring through the newly opened part of his rear turret. God, it was cold, but he could see better than he had ever done before. If he bent forward, he could almost get his head outside the aircraft. When he rotated the turret, the slipstream passing across the barrels of the four Brownings made a gentle screaming sound like high wind through telephone wires. He kept the turret moving, making the gun muzzles describe little circles as he had practised at gunnery school with pencils in the muzzles. A good gunner, could write his name like that. It was a lonely position in the rear turret, especially when night fighters were about, for then chatter on the intercom was forbidden. Flash Gordon and Lovenhertz were staring towards each other with all the concentration they could muster, but the night was too dark for either of them to see anything. Flash heard Cohen order a change of course and watched the clouds slide past the tail. August watched the red blip change direction on the Seaberg table. Villy marked it with a pencil. He's turned to port, said August. Order. Steer 15 degrees left. He's very close now. I think it is us, said Cohen. He's told him to change direction. Jam him, said Lambert urgently. Jimmy Grimm turned his 1154 transmitter to the 1155 receiver, heard its whistle, sought the silent dead space and switched on the microphone that was fixed inside the engine. Lambert banked steeply to change course again. In the night fighter they were silent. Lovenhertz had turned as directed. Rosek, the observer, had his field glasses to his eyes and was scanning each side of the aircraft where the radar did not point. Suddenly, Sachs's radar tube lit up at the end of the range circle. A Tommy at extreme range. We've got him, said Sachs, trying hard to keep the excitement out of his voice. Suddenly, jamming deafened them. So near were they to Jimmy Grimm's radio transmitter. Just in time, said Lovenhertz, and they turned the noise to minimum. Lovenhertz switched the gun safety catches to fire, and a line of red lights appeared on the instrument panel. Suddenly the whole Junkers hit a patch of turbulence. The plane dipped steeply like a horse refusing a fence. A wingtip fell, and Lovenhertz had to use all his strength to correct the plane's heading. The Tommy's slipstream, said Lovenhertz, but the others knew what it was. The force of it showed how close they were, behind the speeding bomber. He's turning right, said Sachs, as the blip on his screen started travelling along its baseline. He's turning, keep turning, he watched the tube. Level out, but keep turning, range still closing, straighten out, range still closing, too fast, 1,200 metres. Lovenhertz followed the turn, until when heading almost due south, the bomber straightened out, and Lovenhertz did too. Where do you want him, asked Sachs. Slightly starboard. He's about seven degrees starboard. That's enough, read off the range. Under 1,000 metres, closing slowly. Lovenhertz wanted to move on to the bomber as slowly as possible, for that would give him the maximum duration of gunfire. Bring me in level with him. I'll lose height when we get a visual. It's still very dark. You'd do better to have him against that bright cirrus. Very well, bring me in a little below him. 900 left a touch. We're coming in too quickly, Herr Oberleutnant. I can't see him. Still too fast. Damn, why is he throttling right back? Lovenhertz reduced his speed until Sachs grunted. That's in order, Herr Oberleutnant. Still can't see him. We're very close, 500 metres. Got him, 
said Lovenhertz, and at the same time, Mrosek also gave a yell. Eight yellow dots of exhaust flame pinpricked a horizon across the darkness. And because all primitive rituals, especially those concerned with death, have their own vocabulary, Lovenhertz reported his sighting to Bach with the words, kettle drums, kettle drums. Lancaster bomber, said Mrosek, whose task it was to identify the targets before an attack. You beauty, said Lovenhertz. Flash Gordon was a mild man, small in stature, humble in origin, and quiet of voice, and yet within him was growing a hatred of Binty Jones that he wouldn't have thought possible. Hardly a day went by without a jibe or a word of sarcasm, and now most recent and hurtful of all was Binty's scorn of his turret modification. If Binty had publicly recognised what a fine idea it was, then the gunnery officer might have ordered the turrets of all squadron planes to be similarly altered. Who knows? It might have been called the Gordon Panel. Invented by a gunner named Gordon, people say he was one of the greatest gunnery experts the Air Force ever had. Although Flash Gordon never told real lies, he had come to realise that sometimes a white lie can be necessary for the sake of mankind's progress. If telling a lie was the only way of having an excellent modification incorporated into Wiley Fenn's aeroplanes, then a lie wouldn't stand in its way. In ten minutes, I'll do it, he thought, but changed his mind. There would never come a quieter time than now. That fighter scare was over, and they were quite alone in the sky. Fighter, fighter, corkscrew port, go, said Flash Gordon. Without bothering to use the sights, he opened fire into the blank darkness. Lambert, obeying instinctively the command that any crew member was empowered to give, flung creaking door into a vertical bank and let it drop through the air like a slate. Binty Jones, not to be outdone by his colleague, also fired his guns. Curves of tracer hose-piped across the sky as door fell faster than its turrets could turn. My God, said Lovenhertz as the tracer came towards him. Instinctively, he shied away while Dawes' eight exhaust flames tipped vertical and slid out of sight under his nose. The little three o three bullets that the Tommies fired were seldom fatal against the solidly built Junkers, but still Lovenhertz found it impossible to fly through them. He's seen us, said Mrosek. Lovenhertz swore. He followed the bomber down, trying to bring the flame spots up past the windscreen again, but now that he was higher than the bomber, he no longer had the advantage of the moonlit clouds. Lambert was following the classic manoeuvre of the corkscrew and chanting its litany as he went to warn the crew, diving port, climbing port, roll, climbing starboard, diving starboard, roll, diving port, climbing port. Many times Lovenhertz had seen such an evasive pattern. Four or five times he had been able to execute identical manoeuvres in formation with his victim and kill him while they danced together. He could not do it this time. For a corkscrew can be executed in such a leisurely fashion that it occupies ten miles of airspace. Some pilots corkscrewed like this the whole journey. Or it can be the brutal wing-wrenching, back-breaking manoeuvre that Lambert now put into effect. Lost contact, said Sachs. My fault, said Lovenhertz. The night fighter's Lee C-1 airborne radar projected only a narrow cone of signal straight ahead, between 60 and 30 degrees to be precise. Lovenhertz waggled his aircraft through a horizon-searching series of manoeuvres. It was no use. He switched on the radio transmitter. Announcement, said Lovenhertz. Katza 1, contact lost. Katza 1, said August, his voice still badly marred by the jamming. Order, steer 200 degrees. August looked at the plotting table and saw that the blip that was creaking door was at the extreme edge of his sector. He has luck, that Tommy, said August. If he turned the other way, we'd still be able to go after him. There are plenty more where he came from, said Villy. In creaking door, Lambert had stopped corkscrewing. His hands were trembling. So that Battersby would not notice, he kept a tight grip on the controls. Suddenly the pain in his back and shoulder, unnoticed during the time of danger, returned with new ferocity. Give me a course for Nordwick, Koch, said Lambert. 086, Skip, said Cohen. Always the perfect navigator, he had been keeping the calculation fresh while waiting for the question. Now do you believe in my clear vision panel? Flash Gordon asked the world at large. He had waited long enough for a word of congratulation or thanks. Bloody good show, said Lambert. I don't believe you saw anything, accused Binty Jones. A damn great night fighter man. In fact, I think I may have hit him. Balls, said Binty. There was nothing there. Then why were you firing, asked Flash. There was no reply. 
the Gordon Clearview panel, I'm going to call it. Just an old-fashioned liar with old Binty, began the fourth verse of the song. For Christ's sake, belt up everyone, said Lambert. Air Sweet had lost headway by the wind error back at Lowestoft, and Dor had been turning and corkscrewing over the ocean, so that by midnight, German time, while both Sweet and Lambert were eight miles short of the coastline, Tommy Carter in Joe for King and Fleming in the Volkswagen had reached Nordwick, turned and were four miles along their final leg for the target. About midway between them, two miles off Nordwick, Lovenhertz was moving back over the sea. Twice he had passed within 100 yards of Joe for King. For a few seconds, his wingtip was only 20 feet from the tailplane of a Halifax. But none of the crews had spotted these near misses, and to them the sky seemed vast and empty. Nordvik an Zee is a holiday resort on the coast of Holland. In 1943, the sand was crisscrossed with barbed wire and steel spears were hidden in the sea. The hotels had become convalescent homes and military offices, and the wide seafront that in peacetime was crowded with holidaymakers was guarded by armed sentries. The lighthouse stands on the modern esplanade, and now its shaded light was switched on while the convoy moved past. The flat cruiser, Helt, was leading the line of ships, and it located the bomber stream as they passed overhead. Each time the Helt fired, the sound rattled every window in Nordvik, and flashes lit up the whole seafront. The red fire of one salvo burst uncomfortably close to Lovenhertz's Junkers, and he climbed away from the flashes. It was the second time within twelve hours that Admiral Paulak had fired at Lovenhertz, but there was, of course, no way in which either of them would ever know that. How nice of them, said Lambert. They've got the Nordvik lighthouse switched on for us. He asked Cohen for a course that would take him well short of the nearby town of Leiden with its notorious flak concentrations. Even while Lambert and Digby in the nose were looking at the pulsating glimmer of the lighthouse, the whole esplanade suddenly lit up as if the sun had selected that town for a private dawn. Two Pathfinder Lancasters had dropped flares to mark it as the turning point for the bomber stream. The lighthouse keep appeared out of the window at the blinding yellow Christmas trees of flares that inched slowly downward, crackling loudly and sending up snakes of white smoke. Illuminated by the flares, the smoke looked yellow. So did all the hotels, and the faces of the sentries, and the Luftwaffe aircrew staring out of the windows of the convalescent home. Koch, said Lambert, turning point markers at Nordvik. Cohen pulled aside the curtain that screened his chart table. The light from his desk was briefly reflected in Lambert's windscreen before Cohen switched it off. It took him a moment to adjust his eyes to the dark. Then he leaned across to the window and saw the strip of coastline, with its hotels and lighthouse lit by the flares. That would be about right, said Cohen, and stood staring for a moment before going back to his charts. Lovenhertz, two miles to the north, also saw the flares. Ermin controlled from Katza 1, he said, turning point markers going down on Nordvik. I'll head towards them until you give me a contact. At Ermin, Willi Reinecke quickly wiped the wax pencil marks off the frosted glass as the kitchen orderly returned with more coffee. The wide-eyed young man served Willi and August, and then gave one each to the blip operators who sat under the table. He gave one to the telephone man too. Outside, the orderly had seen a big glow in the sky. Big fires to the north of here, he confided. Leiden's getting it, I should think. Scornfully, the telephonist said, Nonsense, that's just the Tommies dropping their marker flares to help the bombers find their way. The raid hasn't begun yet, Junger. He took the hot coffee and put in three sugars. It was going to be a long night if they came back this way. Very, very high. In the sky, above Nordvik, a fast RAF mosquito also saw the flares. The 8.8 centimetre flak could not reach the mosquitoes because they flew so high. The Versbergs had difficulty tracking them because they were made of wood, and the night fighters had not been able to catch them because they were so fast. This one was flying to Ahaus, where he would turn south for 50 miles, and flying under electronic guidance would lay four red markers upon Krefeld for the heavy bombers to pound. That, at any rate, was the plan. Meanwhile, it was exactly one minute past one o'clock when the flares went down on Nordvik. Within seconds, reports of them were being phoned to the Opera House at Dielen, where they were marked in on the giant screen. Sentries in coastal watchtowers saw them, and so did air raid volunteers on factory roofs. The control room of the flak cruiser Helt gave their bearing, and the Hitler Jugend gunners at Ahaus reported their glow. In the Flugwachkommando at Duisburg, the experts waited to see whether the planes would really turn at Nordvik. 
It was an RAF trick to drop TP markers, having briefed their crews to ignore them. This had sometimes caused the Fluco to warn the wrong district, and workers lost sleep sitting in damp cellars, cursing the Luftwaffe. Still worse, the defences and people in the real target were left unprepared. Within two minutes, there were enough other reports to persuade them that the stream was turning. Van Zentel's commander needed only to nod to his attentive deputies. PAZs, pre-alert zones, became ARZs, alert zones, and the bombers moved eastwards. The country over which the bombers moved blacked out completely. Railways stopped, stations went dark, factory workers took shelter. AD 30, for the whole Ruhr, Air Danger 30. Cities, towns and villages, as far as Cologne and Dortmund, were told to prepare for an attack in 30 minutes. At the flak site, cigarettes were doused and coffee abandoned as men came grumbling, laughing and yawning out of the rest huts, buttoning their greatcoats against the chilly night. The barrels were elevated, searchlights tilted, radar warmed and shells fused. Civil defence workers, police, fire engines and hospitals were warned too. Shelters were unlocked and the Nazi party organisation through which bombed out civilians were cared for began to prepare. Fires were lit under vats of soup, blankets were sorted, shrouds made ready, ration cards endorsed and bundles of second-hand clothing untied. Altgarten was now in the PAZ.